This video is sponsored by Thrive Market. KC interview, soft sticks. There is outrage over a new docuseries where the truth lies featuring Casey Anthony. Now the latest explosive allegation, she is blaming her father. She lied for 31 days after her daughter goes missing. Why did I wait 31 days to call 911? Casey has always claimed she was looking for her missing daughter on her own. But these text messages paint a different picture. On that call, there's no emotion. There's no nothing. Yeah, it's weird. It, it's very weird. When I was friends with Casey, she lied about everything. When I lied, there was always at least some part of the truth that was a part of the lie. But Casey, if we don't find her, you know, they're building, they're trying to build a case against you, honey. I did lie to law enforcement. I admitted that I lied to law enforcement. So I am a convicted liar. It's the truth. Um, I have a question. Did you get paid? Imagine with me for a second that you're sitting in the back of a crowded courtroom. So the seats are all on the edge of the room, are all old and made of splintering wood that kind of creaks as you shift, trying to get a better view of the room in front of you. There's a sea of heads just kind of blocking your vision, all brunettes and blondes. But above them, you can make out the top half of a man who's just pacing back and forth in front of the jury box ahead. He's talking about something awful, something no one and yet seemingly everyone wants to talk about and the words just break your heart. At first, he's painting a picture of a beautiful family stricken by horror, the tragic death of a two-year-old child loved and cherished by all and the chaos caused by her mother in the aftermath of lies. Every word cuts deeper than the last because it's not just a story, not to you. It's your life. This family must keep its secrets quiet, the man says, and you feel the beat of your heart with every word. And it all began when Casey was eight years old, her father came into her room and began to touch her inappropriately. Though not a single one in the sea of well-groomed heads turns to look at you, you know they desperately want to. As the world slows down around you and you're overtaken with emotion, the question on everyone's mind is, is, how are you feeling in this moment? Well, if you're George Anthony, Casey Anthony's father, being accused in open court of heinous abuse for years, you might feel disgusted, maybe outraged, furious that something like this, something so irrelevant and untrue, is being brought up at a time when baby Kaylee should be the focus. Or, what if George was scared? What if he was terrified because his daughter, Casey Anthony, was finally doing something he never taught her to do? Tell the truth about him. This is very much the question at the heart of the new Peacock documentary, Casey Anthony, Where the Truth Lies. There have been so many lies on record coming from Casey Anthony's mouth, and now, 11 years later, after being found not guilty, Casey Anthony steps out of the shadows to tell what many believe to be a whole new set of lies that outright accuse her father for the death of Kaylee. This documentary is so twisted and filled with so many holes that I thought, okay, let's take her new claims and compare them side by side with her old claims before and during the trial to flesh out the inconsistencies and try to piece together what really might have happened. So I'm going to lay it all out, the case, the trial, the claims, and some shocking rediscoveries on very old and forgotten information that I think is crucial and pretty eye-opening now that Casey has made all of these new claims, okay? I'm just kind of like, wow. But you know what, before we get into this, oh, hi there, hello, hello, hi, it's my face again, swoop, 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 ah. <laughs> hi, hello, welcome. I know I didn't do the theme song at the beginning of the last one, so I knew y'all would roast me if I didn't do it this time, so hi. If you are new here, hi, my name is Swoop. I'm a documentary filmmaker and am obsessed with stories that challenge what I thought I knew about them, so if you're into mind-bending deep dives that tell stories from a new perspective, you've come to the right place. If that sounds good to you, please go ahead and flirt with that like button, okay? Don't be coy. Also, hit subscribe and turn on all notifications so you don't miss a single deep dive.
live and general disclaimer that I have to make, everything I present here is my personal opinion based on the research. Please form your own opinion and of course don't spread any hate. Now I do wanna give a big thank you to today's sponsor and to all of you for making this possible and then we will dive right into this case. So I don't know about you, but I feel like there is less time in the day than ever before. Like I am always running around doing a hundred things and going to the grocery store is not something I want to spend my time doing. <laughs> and can we talk about these grocery store prices, honey? So recently I started getting my staple groceries from Thrive Market and it has seriously changed everything. So Thrive Market is an online membership based grocery store on a mission to make healthy living easy and affordable for everyone with guaranteed savings on every order. I love Thrive Market because not only does it save me tons of time and even more money on every single item, but it helps me actually eat healthier. Now what I like to do with Thrive Market is fill up on all of my like pantry staples. So I got these organic sea salt tortilla chips and I also got these avocado potato chips with Himalayan pink salt. I also got some organic spaghetti pasta. Then I got organic black beans. Then I got some organic roasted and salted mixed nuts. And I got my staple some avocado oil to do cooking with. I got all of this stuff for such a freaking cheap price. So as a Thrive Market member, you'll save on every single order and get the highest quality organic and sustainable products. And if you find a lower price somewhere else, they will match it. Seriously, like what grocery store do you know is price matching instantly? It just doesn't happen. And on top of that, you can earn cash back. So whenever you see this, you can expect to earn Thrive cash back for that product. The first time I used Thrive Market, I was actually shocked at how much I saved. And it doesn't stop with groceries. Thrive Market also carries eco-friendly cleaning supplies, non-toxic beauty, items, supplements, personal care items, organic kids products. You can actually filter the catalog of products by diet and lifestyle product types. Whether you are gluten-free, vegan, or keto, you can shop by over 90 plus different diets. Love that. And even better, orders over $49 are shipped free and delivered with carbon and neutral shipping and from zero waste warehouses, and it is delivered straight to your door. So save yourself time and money and try out Thrive Market today and click the link in my description box or go to thrivemarket.com swoop to get 30% off of your first order and a free gift worth up to $60 when you join Thrive Market today. You're gonna love it, I promise, honey. I have to thank you with all of my heart for being here week after week and for riding with me like, through this year. And also for checking out the sponsors, which is a great way to help support this channel. It encourages them to keep coming back and sponsor more videos so I can make more content. And once again, I wanna give a huge thank you to everyone who has snatched up your Petty University items from the new Dropout merch collection. Thank you to everyone who has tagged me so far in your outfit photos. I love seeing those and reposting them. If you haven't already, and you want to join the community, you can tap the link in the description or the pinned comment to grab your Petty University item and all of the restocks that are happening right now. That sale is gonna finish by the end of the year. Okay, now let's dig into the truth and lies of Miss Casey Anthony. And I can tell you, uh, just for a certainty, that everything you've told me so far has been a lie. I, I can tell you that with, with a certainty, and let me explain why. Okay, history time. So we're gonna make this fast because I feel like we're all pretty familiar with this case over the years, but just to quickly recap, everyone take a deep breath. <sighs> So Casey Anthony was born in Ohio in 1986 to parents George and Cindy Anthony. In 2005, after the family had moved to Orange County, uh, Florida, and at age 19, Casey gave birth to Kaylee Marie Anthony, though the father's identity was at the time unclear. On June 16th of 2008, Kaylee was allegedly last seen by Casey's father, George, leaving the house with Casey at about 12.50 p.m. Casey had said that she was going to drop Kaylee off at a nanny's place and then head to work. Then 31 days later on July 15th, Cindy Anthony, Casey's mom, calls the police. 911, what's your emergency? I called a little bit ago, the deputy sheriff. I found out my granddaughter has been taken. She has been missing for a month. We're talking about a three-year-old little girl. My daughter finally admitted that the baby's in the store. I need to find her. When the police came to question Casey, she told lie after lie after lie, just leading them on the most 
ridiculous wild goose chase around her neighborhood, uh, fake places she claimed this nanny lived, and eventually leading them to the offices of Universal Studios where she claimed to work. When it was clear that she couldn't keep lying to the police, she admitted she didn't work there. She was like, oopsie, um, actually I don't work here. Ha <laughs> tee hee. And she was immediately taken for interrogation. I'm here with uh, Detective Happy Wells, um, also here with Casey Anthony, and uh, Casey, we, we talked earlier this morning, and uh, we're working a case looking for your daughter Kaylee, is that correct? Yes. Okay, uh, we came here to Universal Studios, we're, we're sitting in a little conference room, you know, obviously the door isn't locked, we just closed it so we could have a little bit of privacy and talk to you, mm -hmm. and uh, a couple more questions came up, I'm going to need to ask you about. I should say interrogation at Universal Studios, by the way. They were like, nah, bitch, okay, we going down the hall to the break room. You gonna sit your ass down, Miss Casey. We gonna have a chat. Stick your lies, Casey, okay? Casey, no. Someone honestly just needed to tell Casey no a few times. We're about halfway down that hill, three quarters down that hill, and it's a pretty big snow bubble, which means that there's a lot of stuff going on right now. And I can tell you uh, just for a certainty that everything you've told me so far has been a lie. Casey, Casey, no. I can tell you that with a certainty, and let me explain why. Now, I did a pretty thorough analysis of key moments in the police interview, as well as the jail calls to come. So if you wanna see that, just check out my previous video. It is fucking eye-opening to say the least. But here at Universal, there wasn't a single thing that she told the police that seemed to make any sense. So they all had the same questions that everyone in the media was soon going to have, right? Like, how was Casey so nonchalant about her daughter's disappearance? Why did she wait 31 days before telling anyone she was missing? Why? did her mother have to force her to talk to 911? What in the Pete Davidson is up with that awful fucking tattoo? Win any hot body contests lately, Casey? Casey, no. Casey, Casey, Casey. Come on, Casey. Yeah, can I speak with her? Casey, they want to talk to you. Hello? Hello? Yes. Can you tell me what's going on a little bit? I'm sorry? Can you tell me a little bit what's going on? My daughter's been missing for the last 31 days. So because of the lies, Casey was arrested for child neglect. And as she sat behind bars, the evidence continued to pile up and still hope for finding Kaylee remained. To this tipster who says she saw Kaylee at OIA back on July the 2nd. Cindy says this is the best tip they've gotten so far, but investigators here say they're not quite so optimistic. It has been over five weeks since little Kaylee Anthony vanished. The search for missing Kaylee Anthony may be coming to a very sad end. Prosecutors in Florida now say it's beginning to look like she was murdered. That is until December of 2008 when human remains matching Kaylee's description were tragically discovered in the woods just down the street from the Anthony household. And it was just a heart, just wrenching, terrible loss. No child should ever be harmed, let alone harmed like this. With regret, I'm here to inform you that the skeleton remains found on December 11th are those of the missing toddler Kaylee Anthony. So prosecutors quickly announced that they were going to seek the death penalty charging Casey with the ending of her own daughter. An Orange County grand jury has issued an indictment and a capius has been issued on the following charges. First degree murder, aggravated child abuse, aggravated manslaughter of a child, and four counts of providing false information to law enforcement. Now, the trial didn't begin until May of 2011, and it lasted for six weeks. Each day, another parade of witnesses gave dramatic testimony with the members of Casey's family being firmly at the center, and George Anthony, Casey's father, seemed to be the defense's star witness, like taking the stand many times throughout trial. Need to break the stand? <laughs> no, sir, I need to get through this. I need to have... Okay. Something inside of me get through this. Now, everyone thought the prosecution had the case, you know, like in the bag, like open and shut. I don't know what I'm doing, but that's like an open and shut, you know, <laughs> bank shot. Like, I know it's supposed to be innocent until proven guilty, but like. Daughter there? Yeah, can I speak with her? They want to talk to you. Answer the question. Hello? I mean. The first thing you do, okay, is you lie to the detective whose job it is to try to find your daughter. But really, though. Who did you call first? Who did you go to for help first to help try to find her? Oh, no, okay. All right. Well, I'm glad we got that straightened out. But then came July 5th, 2011. A jury of her peers found Casey Anthony not guilty of the murder of her daughter, Kaylee Marie Anthony. We, the jury, find the defendant not guilty. So say we all. Dated at Orlando. 
Orange County, Florida. She was, however, convicted of lying to police and sentenced to four years, but the sentence was mostly canceled out by her time awaiting trial and credits for good behavior. So about two weeks later, Casey Anthony walked free. Two weeks later later and the world just kind of the world just lost its collective shit okay i'm not even it was madness a crowd of more than 100 behind plastic barricades came to watch and for the most part jeer her release i'm not going to let uh, some cookie jury stop justice not for me anyway why would you wait till 11 years after the trial and tell it to some producer for peacock on november 29th just a few weeks ago, 2022, NBC's streaming service Peacock uploaded a new documentary about Casey Anthony, one that doesn't aim to relitigate every piece of testimony and evidence. No, 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 no. It's to tell her side of the story while presenting it as a fair and balanced documentary. Why would you not, if you're 100% innocent, tell the people defending you in your death penalty trial what really happened? Why would you wait till 11 years after the trial and tell it to some producer for Peacock. Why after all these years of silence, of watching the world's reaction to her verdict, why is this series platforming Casey to tell the world more lies, allegedly? Now, in my opinion, as a filmmaker, after watching all three episodes, I estimate that the vast majority of this documentary was actually scripted and rehearsed well in advance. I mean, she's had 11 years to like, you know, and they're acting out quite Quite a few lines like Casey and the off-camera interviewer and often Casey is fed lines by this person off-camera to direct Casey's answers in the way that I think they want them to go it's, it's it's very apparent to me again I wasn't on set but like when you do this line of work there's things you know I myself just did an interview section and provided some of my own documentary work for another documentary on the Gabby Petito case and it happened to be on P Peacock, but it was with a completely different production team. Gabby's story touching all of us in this way has really catapulted the conversation around how we talk to survivors, how we see the signs. You're absolutely not alone, and I know that is the cliche phrase that we all use, but it is true. Often with documentaries like this, you're given the gist of what you'll be discussing in advance, and so as producers, generally you want to have a theme of questions, but then you let the conversation flow and the interview should piggyback on the answers that are given and ask deeper questions for more insight. And like, none of that happened in Casey's documentary that, that I could see. Like oftentimes it sounded very much like the interviewer was feeding Casey lines and directing her in the emotion that they wanted to capture by giving her leading statements and questions. Hello? Hi. Can you tell me a little bit what's going on? My daughter's been missing for the last 31 days. What are you thinking and feeling on that call? There's no emotion. There's no, nothing. Nothing. Yeah, it's weird. It, it's very weird. Now, generally, leading statements like that when the subject isn't thinking about it or answering that way, take away from the documentary and make it feel forced. And that's the feeling that I had with about 90% of this documentary to the point I wouldn't call it a documentary. Like to me, it's just an op-ed piece told in three parts with a clear bias and agenda. You know, that, that's it. But you weren't going through the cycles of grief. No. That's just my opinion, but I don't believe that Casey nor the producers had any intention of actually confronting the accusations. Like, I think they wanted you, the viewer, to think they were willing to discuss it by putting a couple minutes segment in the front of the first episode, uh, listing, you know, the prosecution side, the case against Casey, and then never addressing any of those claims, really, as if someone had forgotten about the evidence and the recordings of Casey's behavior back then when she didn't tell anyone her daughter was gone for 31 days and the smell of a dead body in her trunk that was verified by cadaver dogs. There's something wrong. I found my daughter's car today and it smells like there's been a dead body in the damn car. Like on that, let's remember the car was in Casey's possession the entire time, not 
her father's. And what about the damn duct tape with an imprint of a heart-shaped sticker found on Kaylee's mouth? None of this is like addressed because this was never supposed to be an honest account and facing the accusations. People are no longer talking about how or even why Kaylee Anthony passed away. They are instead talking about the manner in which a mother responded to her daughter's death. Now, I think most everyone came to the same conclusion. Casey is a liar. And her behavior shows with extreme clarity that she does not care about her daughter, in my opinion, right? And you know, I gotta give a nod to Miss Bombshell tonight herself, love that, Nancy Grace. Like, no one was more famous for reiterating all of the most alarming evidence and questioning it into oblivion than Nancy Grace. You are seeing grillings as best as they can by Georgia Cindy Anthony of the Taunt Mom. But you know what, while we're here, here's what Nancy Grace had to say about this new documentary. That I was contacted by this group when the director was still working on it, to have a sit down with Tot Mom Casey Anthony under these conditions. And I said, absolutely not. Because when I learned I couldn't ask the questions I wanted, I couldn't control what was happening, no way, because she's gonna do exactly what we predict. She's gonna have softball questions and lie her way through it with no one to test her, such as under cross-examination. And this is a way for her to get fame, notoriety, as if she needed any more, and probably money. And after spending time re-immersing myself in decades old reporting, I want to take you through what I see as some of the key stepping stones that the makers of this documentary are likely trying to trick you with into changing your perception of Casey. So tell us, Casey, where exactly does the truth lie? As far as I'm concerned, there's, there's no justifying my actions or behavior, except to say that I was doing what I was conditioned to do. It was the right guilty verdict. I did lie to law enforcement. I admitted that I lied to law enforcement. So I am a convicted liar. It's the truth. It's no secret Casey Anthony is a skilled liar. Like no matter anything that is said in this or any documentary about her, that's a fact everyone could see over and over again during her trial. Her admitting it here doesn't really mean much at all. Now there has been a lot of talk about Casey being a pathological liar. And let's just, I just want to address that real quick, a little gently. A pathological liar is not necessarily a diagnosable condition most often, but it can be a sign of another condition or personality disorder order that only a medical professional could diagnose. And it's not a term for someone who just like lies a lot. It's quite a bit deeper than that. A key feature of a pathological lie is that it has no obvious motivation. It is usually possible to determine why someone has told a lie, such as to benefit themselves or avoid an embarrassing or stressful social situation. But pathological lying occurs for no clear reason and does not seem to benefit the individual. So all of Casey's lies were for her benefit. And side note, all of Casey's lies were for her benefit. That's why it's like kind of questionable if we're throwing around the pathological word, but she does lie a lot. Now, Casey's friend Annie, who plays a prominent role in this documentary, says that she believes Casey didn't or couldn't hurt Kaylee. Until she herself tells me that she did it, there's no way. No way she killed that baby. Sounds convincing, right? But let's follow the rest of that clip. The very next thing she says is literally this. I think an accident probably happened. And I think that she did what she always did and she lied. Oh, okay, whoa, whoa. There's no way she lied. No way she killed that baby. She lied. What? <laughs> like, what about the duct tape? What about the 31 days? What about the diary entry? And excuse me, but you said she couldn't hurt that baby. And in the same breath, you said she did what she always did and lied. She lied. Bullshittery do da shittery hey. Sorry, Petty's creeping out. Okay, she coming, she's looking around the corner. She's like, is it time? Is it time? Are we rolling the intro net? Not yet. So like, I don't know, man. I feel like Casey's friend is most likely saying some dumb shit like this because she can't handle the actual most likely truth. I mean, like here's another friend on the phone with Casey when Casey was in jail. I just want to talk to Tony and get a little bit of- Casey, you have to tell me if you know anything about Kaylee. Wait, if anything happens with Kaylee, Casey, I'll die. You understand? I'll die. If anything happens to that baby. Oh my God, calling you guys a waste. 
huge waste. Casey thought that someone being emotional and upset over the idea that her daughter might be gone was a total waste. And did you hear how annoyed and actually bitter Casey's tone of voice was? If anything happens to that baby. Oh my God, calling you guys a waste, huge waste. Then Casey goes on to say that she lied because there was a kernel of truth in every lie, as if that means something. When I lied during this and even prior to, there was always at least some part of the truth that was a part of the lie, a kernel of truth within the lie. When I was friends with Casey, she lied about everything. When Casey was questioned by the police, she said she dropped Kaylee off at this apartment complex. Well, I used to live in that apartment complex. I think in her mind, she wasn't lying. She had brought Kaylee there before she had never dropped her off. Kaylee had been there. In her mind, she wasn't lying. Bitch! <laughs> like, I just like, what was she doing then? Telling the whole truth and nothing but the truth? And like the documentaries just let this go through unchallenged as if it's the new truth. Okay, whatever, just just keep rolling the tape. A kernel of truth within the lie. And that means what exactly? That you're a liar, way to go, way to go. She used a kernel of truth within the lie to make the lie more believable and more detailed. You know what, actually, okay, it, it's time, okay? Petty University, roll the intro. Let's just pluck out one key moment from this case, the first time Casey talks to the 911 operator. Is there a Talk to you. Answer the question. Hello? Hello? Yes. Can you tell me what's going on a little bit? I'm sorry? Can you tell me a little bit what's going on? My daughter's been missing for the last 31 days. That's a lie. She was never missing. And you know who has her? I know who has her. I've tried to contact her. I actually received a phone call today. Oh, that's a lie. She never contacted anyone. Now from a number that is no longer in service. I did get to speak to my daughter for about a moment, about a minute. And that's a lie. It's all a lie. Every f word. So tell me, dear Casey, where is the kernel of truth in this diatribe of lies? <laughs> Class dismissed. So what about all the lies Casey told growing up? Well, one big example of her lying behavior is this, which I think speaks for itself. As far as I'm concerned, there's, there's no justifying my actions or behavior. Except to say that I was doing what I was conditioned to do. What you were conditioned to do or what you practiced doing because you had been manipulating your parents with lies your whole life and got away with it, see? perspective, right, Casey? Lies about boyfriends, lies about the fact she wasn't going to graduate high school because she skipped her entire second half of senior year. Lies about working at Universal. I, like, I just, I love how the Peacock documentary conveniently ignores so many facts of her lying, letting her go on a potentially false smear campaign about her father, with no one kind of like chin-checking her history of blatant lies. In fact, when you ask the question where Casey learned to lie from, it seems from the stories she's telling, she learned it all from her father. Telling the truth, especially in our house, wasn't allowed. It all comes back to my dad. He was a man who was incapable of ever telling anyone the truth. Okay, but is that a kernel of truth within a lie or whatever? You, you see the problem here, right? When I was friends with Casey, she lied about everything. So how could anyone trust anything that she says? So Casey finds this interview of her parents when they're fighting. Mind you, this is long after their granddaughter lost her life and their daughter was locked up and then released, where they were eventually divorced. Now the documentary leaves out all of that context. And Casey says, hey, Peacock, look at this. Savings account that I'd started with, they're gonna take money out. Casey learned by example. And I, wow. okay, you're, you're really, but wait, wait, wait. Please, no, but I'm please, telling you, there please, was, please, we lied to read for me. several years, and that's where our daughter got no, it. Do not, don't personally attack me at this. No, I'm this, not. That's supposed to be about us. I understand that. that personal attack. But I mean, she finally calls him out on it, and, and is finally acknowledging, yes, I learned from his example completely. It's my dad's fault completely. I love how she says completely. Total exoneration, great, here we are. What about those 31 days after your daughter was missing? I 
completely replicated my father's behavior during those 31 days. I watched him lie, manipulate, take money from people. I did all of those things. It was to protect myself from the outside world. But wait, 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 hold up. Okay, was that a mistake? Did did Miss Anthony slip up? Did did anyone catch that? But for me, it wasn't to protect myself because of what I had done. It wasn't to protect myself from what I had done. I mean, did she misspeak or is that a little slip? Y'all tell me. This is phrased like an admission that she did do something. But you know, like her attorney said, let's just blame it all on the rest of her family instead. If there's one thing you've learned about this family it, and its dysfunction, is that they don't mind putting on another face. Lies are what pumps and what and what lives within this family. And I told you that in the very beginning. She was raised that way. You believe what about where Kaylee is? She's okay. That's what I believed the entire time, not just with the cops, every day that I sat in jail. So Peacock does attempt to explain away the 911 call from Casey's point of view. So let's go back to the beginning. July 16, 2008, the day that Kaylee's kidnapping is reported. Hello? Hi. Can you tell me a little bit what's going on? My daughter's been missing for the last 31 days. Okay, you know what? Hold my petty because they conveniently... Hold my petty. I'm going to say hold my beer. Hold my petty, okay? So they conveniently left out a lot of context here. So here's how that 911 call really went. <laughs> They conveniently cut out the part leading up to it where Casey's mother, Cindy, calls, she's the one who calls, and is absolutely distraught and frantic. They cut all of that out, openly ignoring and erasing facts and context, which is what I have a problem with. Hello? Hello? Yeah. Can you tell me what's going on with him? I'm sorry? Can you tell me a little bit what's going on? My daughter's been missing for the last 31 days. It's all cut out. And you can hear Casey is just totally void of any interest or emotion and can't be bothered. Remember what she said there? I don't have anything to talk to them about, right? I think she says the word about, it gets a little scrambled. And in the documentary, the interviewer says, you don't have any emotion. It's weird. And Casey still stoned face and blocking her mouth, which is usually something people do to like, you know, if they're like covering up lies, it's literally a physical thing that people can often do. She says, yeah, it's weird, right? I was so numb at that point. There's no emotion. There's no, nothing, nothing. Yeah, it's weird. It, it's very weird. I just, what? Like, is that an explanation? I'm just like, is the interviewer going to follow up with a question? No, no, they're not. They're not. They just skip forward to the rest of the 911 call with no explanation there. Just like, it's weird. Yeah, it's weird. Who has her? Do you have a name? Her name is Zenaida Fernandez Gonzalez. I did meet someone named Zenaida Fernandez Gonzalez. She was babysitter, was nanny. All of that's true, was not my nanny, was not my babysitter. Now my question again, what happened to that little kernel of truth, Casey? Like, ain't no nanny, Casey. But then Casey talks about how she was numb. I was so numb during so much of that. So we're gonna come back to this, but saying she was numb is in direct conflict with what Casey says at another time in the car where Casey says, I genuinely believed Kaylee was okay. So at the time of pulling up here with the cops, you believe what about where Kaylee is? She's okay. That's what I believed the entire time, not just with the cops, every day that I sat in jail up until the day she was found, every day. So if you genuinely believed Kaylee was okay, then what the fuck 
were you so numb about? You had nothing to be numb over because according to you, you genuinely believed that your daughter was alive and well and you were partying and getting a tattoo that says beautiful life. You cannot have it both ways there. And this isn't even like two different parts of the documentary. This is literally in the same section and they just bet on people not being able to pick up on these huge inconsistencies when Casey describes her state of mind. There's no emotion. There's no nothing. Nothing. So at the time of pulling up here with the cops, you believe what about where Kaylee is? She's okay. That's what I believed the entire time. I was asleep for a while and I was awoken by him shaking me and asking me where Kaylee was, which didn't make sense because I looked next to me and that's where she was. So now let's take a look at the most important moment of this trial and the Peacock Doc. I'm talking about the day that Kaylee most likely lost her life. On June 16th, 2008, Casey Anthony says she remembers lying down with her daughter to take a nap at home. Now Casey says that Kaylee would never leave her side without saying something, which first of all, she's like two years old, almost about to be three. What two year old is like, knows how to have that kind of discipline. You know what I mean? Now Casey says the only other person who was at home uh, when she laid down was her father, George. The next thing Casey remembers is being shaken in her bed by her father, who was demanding to know where Kaylee was. When Casey checked at her side, she says Kaylee was gone. And was asleep for a while. And I was awoken by him shaking me and asking me where Kaylee was, which didn't make sense because I looked next to me and that's where she was. Casey says she ran around the house looking for Kaylee, but it wasn't until she made a full round and ended up back at the porch that she saw Kaylee in George's arms, her father, soaked and dripping wet, allegedly. I can see him standing there with her in his arms and hand her to me and telling me that it's my fault, that I did that, that I caused that and I just collapsed with her memories. What did she feel like? It's just heavy, it's just cold. Now, Casey says that in that moment, she was hysterical, at a complete loss for what to do, and her father was berating her, telling her it was all her fault. They don't specify what it was. And a moment later, her father took Kaylee from her and told her it was going to be okay and that Kaylee was going to be okay. That she was going to be okay. That's what he said to me. So let's dissect this a little more because there's a lot to unpack between the lines here. Now in this moment where Casey is talking about finding her daughter like this, she never once says Kaylee's name. I can see him standing there with her in his arms. I'm not kidding. You play it back, she doesn't say her name once the name of her own daughter. Now, essentially through this whole segment, she shifts from past tense to present tense, shifts pronouns. At one point she says you, and I think she meant to say me, and she seems very detached and does not actually say her daughter's name. And hand her to me, and telling me that it's my fault, that I did that. So you tell me, do you think that if a mother was handed her daughter like this and she's talking about that traumatic story years later, wouldn't that mother most likely say her own daughter's name all this time later when she's telling the story? Like, wouldn't she probably say her name a lot? Actually, for most of this documentary, Casey only gets emotional when talking about herself being blamed, but there's hardly any sadness when it's about Kaylee. And if y'all saw from my previous doc, you might remember that this is a common theme for Casey the entire time from when Kaylee was finally reported missing in the 911 call. Hello? Hello? Yes. Can you tell me what's going on a little bit? I'm sorry? To when Casey was visited by her parents in jail. And now all these years later, Casey would often only get sad or emotional when talking about herself and her tears and emotion would kind of dry up when it came to talking about Casey, which is the exact opposite that you would expect from a frightened parent. What happened with Haley Casey, I'll die. You understand? I'll die. If anything happens oh, wow. to that baby. Oh my God, calling you guys a waste. She 
huge waste. And actually there was something else that I noticed um, in the documentary early on, like, cause Casey had moved into this house with the, the crew so that they could film this at a remote location. And the interviewer asked Casey, you know, how did you sleep? And Casey, because it's about herself, was like, well, you know, there's no such thing or like what good sleep, you don't get good sleep. How'd you sleep? There's no such thing as good sleep. Not that I know. And I thought that was really interesting because this is 11 years later, right? But I remember a recorded interview with Casey not that long after the trial where she was telling people, I don't give a fuck what people think about me. I sleep pretty good at night. I don't give a about what anybody thinks about me. I don't care about that. I never will. I'm okay with myself. I sleep pretty good at night. So here's another example of that detachment. Casey keeps referring to what happened and her dad allegedly blaming her as, I did that, and that, 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 that. I can see him standing there with her in his arms and telling me that it's my fault, that I did that. It's almost like she's calling her daughter that. Then, as Casey moves along in this contradictory story, she first says that her dad told her everything's gonna be okay, but then she corrects that statement to she thinks she's going to be okay. He takes her from me and he immediately softens his tone and tells me it's gonna be okay. That she was going to be okay. And I think that correction of how she phrased it was because the first statement she made sounds like she did something to Kaylee and her dad was trying to help comfort her and figure out what to do. So she adjusts her statement to saying, I think she's going to be okay. Again, very telling, at least to me. But the question remains, if Casey thought her dad did something, but that Kaylee was okay, why not call an ambulance just to give Kaylee a checkup? Why not tell your mother? Why not do anything other than what she did? Well, Casey says she didn't call the police because of her father. When you're physically afraid of another human being and you are conditioned to say and do what they wanted you to say and do, now, Casey sets up this entire pool incident ahead by saying, I know people are gonna ask why I didn't do this, why I didn't do that, and so on. And I know people are gonna question, well, why didn't I make a phone call? Why didn't I call 911? Why did I even wait to tell my mom anything? Why lie? Why not do a hundred things a hundred different ways? She never answers a single one of those questions, if you really think about it. It's a deflection tactic that people will use. It's a manipulation. She knows that if she simply lists the doubts and questions that the world has, that subconsciously people will feel like she must have answered those questions. I know that people are gonna ask why I didn't do this, why I did this. And then she goes on to talk about something else. By acknowledging those questions exist, the intent is for you, the viewer, to feel Feel like she must have answered them and I, you just didn't notice, right? But she literally never does. That is very telling. But I have to live with that. Knowing that I failed to protect my child. I failed her again and again and again. Now, the biggest question here, which they don't even remotely address, is what the hell did Casey do the moments after her dad allegedly took cold, wet, lifeless Kaylee through the screen door into the house? And I don't know how long I sat outside. I don't know where he went. He took her from me and he walked away. I know he went back in through the screen doors and he went back into the house. But I don't know where she went. I don't know what he did. By the way, I don't I don't know who's walking through a screen door, but what the fuck happened next, Miss Casey Anthony? Like your molecules didn't just suddenly evaporate and reform at your boyfriend's house. So something else happened in that house after your dad allegedly took your daughter. And what parent, I just, I don't know like what parent who has their wet, cold child laid in their lap for a few moments and then lets someone take the child away. What parent lets them be taken away without insisting on following along and not letting that child out of their sight? Like you don't even have to be a particularly good parent for that to be like an instinctual thing of like, nah bitch, I'm going with you. I'm gonna make sure this kid's okay. He takes her from me and he immediately softens his tone and tells me it's gonna be okay. I wanted to believe him. 
Not only is she not telling us if she even bothered to follow her dad, who was apparently carrying her daughter's body, but she never once said what happened next. And like no one called an ambulance, no one called a doctor. And since Casey says she genuinely believed Kaylee was fine. She's okay. That's what I believed the entire time, not just with the cops, every day that I sat in jail up until the day she was found. Every day. Then like, why the hell didn't you stick around and just give Kaylee a warm bath and maybe some milk and cookies? It's blank here. The most crucial part of the story and it is totally fucked balls blank and the interviewer never asked her what happened next. That's how you know this documentary's purpose, in my opinion, is just there to make some money and platform an alleged killer and try to sway your opinion on what happened by just leaving the most important part blank. Now we know from surveillance tape that Casey was seen later that day at a blockbuster video store with her boyfriend. It is also believed that Kaylee was in the trunk of her car at this time. Casey only says that she went to her boyfriend's house, but how? <laughs> When? How did Casey get to her boyfriend's house and spend the next 31 days there until her mom had to literally hunt her down and found Casey smoking weed with the boyfriend like nothing's happening? Remember, Casey left the day that Kaylee was found lifeless. And we gotta be mindful of the details, right? People often say that Casey didn't call 911 until 31 days later, but the thing is, Casey Casey never called 911, her mom did, and had to force Casey to talk to them. Is your daughter there? Yeah, can I speak with her? Okay, they want to talk to you. Like, I do not in any way believe that Casey ever planned to report her daughter missing. And I don't think that Casey was gone for 31 days. I think Casey had planned to be gone indefinitely, forever, like done. She's just like, nah, I'm done. But back to the swimming pool. If Casey's dad took Kaylee's body into the house, Casey would have had to go into the house at some point to get the keys to her car, right? Like, I, I, I know you guys are all, Y'all are with me right now, okay? Because it's just like this, they make a set, Casey. No, she would have had gone into the house to gather some clothes, maybe a toothbrush to, to get things, right? You need things. So Casey telling us that she never followed her limp daughter into the house, that like what? She just never goes into the house ever again to get her keys to go to Blockbuster? And the interviewer never asked one single follow-up question. One would think that's the question, right? Right, Carol, you'd be asking that. Jonathan, I know, I, John, we on the same page, John. I know you'd be, I know you'd be, right? Victoria, you already asked it, didn't I know you did, Victoria, because you good like that, but not these documentary people, okay? I don't know what to do with these people. They'd just be like, okay, we just, mm -hmm. <sighs> Sorry, it just, whew. <laughs> If we want to get a glimpse of what Casey was actually up to during those 31 days, here are some of the text messages. Little Kaylee was reported missing on July 15th. Now, three days earlier, Casey was not busy looking. On July 12th at 1.27 p.m., Casey gets a text message from an unknown person. It reads, if I get everyone together for you tonight, you down to have fun. Later that night, 7.41 p.m., Casey gets another text message from the same unknown person. It reads, back booth tonight, 80s, retro dancing. Tonight, it's on. July 14th, 9.39 p.m., the day before Cindy Anthony reports her granddaughter missing, Casey gets a text from a different unknown person. Scoops tonight. Scoops is a nightclub in Orlando. The message also has a smiley face. Now the next day, July 15th, Casey Anthony's world begins to crumble. At 4.27 p.m. that day, Casey gets a text message from her mother. Call me ASAP, major prob. Later on in the documentary, Casey said she was just following instructions and believed Kaylee was okay. I just had to keep following his instructions. Instructions? <sighs> What instructions? If Kaylee is fine, she's fine, she's good, she's good, then why the hell are there instructions? Like, why lie to the police? For what? Just tell the people she's with grandpa. Just, if she's fine, then she's fine. Whew, my voice went up way too many octaves there. I apologize, I will bring it back down here, okay? But there is the devil in these subtle details, right? This explanation about the instructions is almost so on the surface and right there in front of everyone that most people probably actually miss the real question 
question here. People will probably get caught up asking what were the instructions when the real question is, why is there a need for instructions if you believed Kaylee was fine? Therefore, her whole explanation of these instructions is completely thrown out the window. If you put it all in context based on what's just coming out of her own mouth. Actually, it wasn't until Casey talks about these instructions that Casey finally even says Kaylee's name. During the 31 days, I genuinely believe that Kaylee was still alive. My father kept telling me she was okay. I just had to keep following his instructions. And Casey gives tons of random details about the pool incident, saying that George went through the screen door and heavy, cold sobbing, didn't know what to do. Then she had those details about how she laid with Kaylee and pushed pillows up on the bed against the wall and the TV was on, she's a light sleeper. All of these extra details. I'm used to being on alert, especially with my child next to me. It's part of the reason she slept in bed with me so much, in my bed with pillows, stuffed against the wall with the bed up against it so she couldn't fall, so the bed couldn't move. But when it comes to these instructions, there was absolutely zero details given. When it comes to her dad allegedly taking her daughter away, there's no details about what happens next. I'm willing to guess that anytime she goes limp with details, that's where she's covering up the most. How long had you known Zanida? Almost four years, it'll be four years Christmas this year. She has family down south, her mother and her sister, um, her brother's in New York, she's originally from New York. Pretty much grew up there, moved down here, went to the University of Florida. Like when there are details that are meant to mislead, like the, the nanny stuff, she's over detailed. When there are details meant to hide and cover up, she hardly speaks and then blames trauma. Now, I do have to go on record and say, is it possible that Casey was abused at some point by her dad or her brother or both? It's possible, none of us were there, no one's gonna know except them, but that doesn't change these lies. That's why that's not my focus here. And, and even after all of these lies, Casey is adding that even though it was the story presented by her lawyers, that Kaylee didn't accidentally drown. She's sure of it. And that there was no way for her to have gotten in the pool. So Casey remembers having taken the ladder down from the above ground pool. And the only way that Kaylee would have ended up there, Casey says, is if someone like George put her there. Unless he put her in the pool to cover up what he did. Now, the way I see it when I've looked at the trial and this story and the Peacock doc is that the only story that she could tell that would make any little bit of sense at this point would be if she had said her dad ended Kaylee and she knew he did it and that he threatened her life if she told anyone. I think that is the only story that Casey could have told that would have remotely made her seem like maybe she didn't do anything here and she was forced to comply and follow in instructions, but Casey never claims that. And, and, and either way, that story still screws her because Casey could then potentially be charged with interfering with the police investigation or aiding and abetting if she knew that her father did do something. And I believe that Casey's own ego won't allow her to make up a story that in any way makes her look bad, so she refuses to tell a story that would actually be the most believable for her because she won't allow herself to look guilty for literally anything. I honestly came into this documentary with an open mind. Like I like to approach topics with the idea of let's just pretend that everything that they say is true and work backwards from there. And I tried, trust me, I tried to believe her story. Call me Mulder, I wanna believe, okay? But there is so many inconsistencies that I just cannot consider her a credible witness to this. I was in contact with my father daily but whether or not I saw him at the house or we talked on the phone. But you're trying to tell us that you never asked to talk to Kaylee on the phone? You never saw Kaylee at the house? You didn't insist? Not one? And you get arrested and never once say, hey, you know what, Kaylee is actually fine. My dad has her, so like, I don't know, maybe let me go, cause like, this is weird. None of that happens. Now, here was another detachment and warning sign, in my opinion. When alleging her father was abusive to her and Kaylee, she says this. When you're physically afraid of another human being. Did you notice what she said there? She said, when you are afraid of someone. She doesn't say I was afraid of here. When you're physically afraid of another human being. 
she made it about herself in every other part of the story, but detaches herself here and says, when you, implying that she's not the one who's afraid here. And wrapped up in all of this is Casey's masterclass in how to accuse someone without accusing them, to cast just enough doubt to make your story plausible. It's almost, it's almost actually brilliant in a way. I'm not outright accusing him of murder, but it wasn't an accident in the pool. When Casey is asked, what do you think happened? She says she doesn't know and paints just enough of a picture that she wants you, the viewer, to put the pieces together to blame her dad because she doesn't have enough lies that would make sense. So instead she just doesn't give you anything. It goes for George as well. What do you think really happened? My gut feeling inside, I believe Kaylee was given something and she didn't wake up. I thought this was interesting. Both George and Casey refer to what happened in a detached sort of way where they imply that the other did it without fully stating that. And that is fascinating to me. Casey made a veiled accusation. I'm not outright accusing him of murder, but it wasn't an accident in the pool. And her father also made a veiled accusation. Do you think she intentionally wanted to kill Kaylee? I don't think she intentionally wanted to. I don't, think, I don't think she intentionally wanted to, but she should be in jail because of Kaylee not being here. It's really interesting to me that neither of them declares what happened exactly, and neither fully accuses the other of doing it. So it gives both of them plausible deniability in a way by opening the door for just enough doubt on both of them. So what does that mean? Like, does it mean maybe they both had some part in what happened to Kaylee? Did Kaylee drown and they both covered it up? Was there an accident and he helped to cover it up? Does George not accuse Casey fully because he honestly just doesn't know what happened? Is it to cover up some of his own guilt? Like, what do y'all think? Leave me your thoughts in the comments on that. This interview, one of many that he and my mother did separately and together for money. Now something that just really like girded my loins, I don't even know if that's a word, we're going with it, was when Casey had the whole grain gluten-free audacity to accuse her parents of exploiting Kaylee for money. Take a listen. This interview, one of the many that he and my mother did separately and together for money. For money. Throw me under the bus for money. Why? Why exploit the situation any more than it has been? Child, cha cha. <laughs> Casey, no! Isn't that exactly what you are doing now, Casey? It's been 11 years and you suddenly needed to exploit this situation and you got paid for doing it, right? The devil is a damn lie, I am telling y'all. So check this out. Between the period of July 15th, 2008, the time of the 911 call where Casey finally admits Kaylee was missing, from that time up until until Casey was indicted three months later on October 14th, 2008. Between this time period, ABC News Network paid Casey $200,000 for photos of Kaylee, her daughter. That would be about $276,000 today with inflation, just to give a little more perspective. It's a block. ABC News is facing sharp criticism because it paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to a woman accused of killing her daughter. This woman, while she claims in this documentary she knew her dad had her daughter, that she believed her daughter was okay, she took payment of $200,000 dollars from ABC while lying to them then and claiming Kaylee was missing when she evidently knew she wasn't because she was with her grandpa. Her own daughter wasn't even laid to rest yet and she sold her for two hundred thousand dollars. I am fucking livid. 
Where's the money, Casey? What did you do with it, Casey? I don't think you paid for your defense with it. Now, during the trial, Casey's defense stated that at 3.04 p.m., Casey disconnected the phone call from Jesse Grun to take an incoming call from George Anthony. According to the defense, the 26-second call from her father took place as soon as he got to work to tell her, I took care of everything, telling her he disposed of the body and warning her not to tell her mother about what happened. Now, it's also disputed that that call never happened and Casey didn't answer the phone. But in the Peacock documentary, Casey says that she again genuinely believed Kaylee was okay and with her dad. So in either of these stories that Casey created and told, the story she told her defense team for trial and the story she is telling now on Peacock, both of these stories say that she knew exactly where Kaylee was and that Kaylee was never missing. Either Kaylee was dead and her father took care of it, or Kaylee was okay and with her father. And yet still, knowing exactly where Kaylee was, according to either story, she lied to ABC News and sold her daughter for $200,000. Sorry, my rings are clacking. She lost all credibility for me when she sold her daughter's photos for $200,000 and wasn't looking for her daughter at all. I think that's disgusting. Wow, child, child, if ever there was a time for an innocent kitty palette cleanser, I think we could all use that right now. A couple of things I have to say at the end of each swoop doc, and then I will close with my final thoughts on this case. So first of all, if you got something out of this episode, be sure to flirt with that like button, okay? Don't be shy and hit the subscribe and turn on all notifications so you don't miss a single deep dive. If you wanna get in touch with me, please follow me on Twitter and Instagram and send me a DM. I do my best to read your messages. Also, don't forget to grab your Petty University merch from the brand new Dropout Collection, also linked below, and tag me in your outfit photos so I can repost you. I just love seeing them. And you know what? Actually, for today's shout outs, I want to shout out some of y'all's Petty University outfit photos, okay? Because y'all just be looking so cute. Thank you so much for tagging me. This truly just makes my heart so happy to see you all looking so stinking cute in your outfits. Please do keep them coming. I love it. And please, please do leave me your thoughts thoughts on this case on the documentary. Do you believe Casey? What, what do you believe? I would love to know your thoughts. Be sure to check out Thrive Market today by clicking the link in my description box or go to thrivemarket.com swoop to get 30% off your first order and a free gift worth up to $60 when you join Thrive Market today. You're gonna love it, honey. They often say that each person has a side and that the truth lies somewhere in the middle. And oftentimes that truth is the most obvious part of the story when you remove all of the clutter around it. Now, was Casey ever abused by her father or brother? No one will ever know the truth to that except them. So we put that over here and regardless of that, Casey has proven herself a hundred times over of lying constantly. Lied to her parents for years, lied to the 911 operator, lied to her boyfriend, her friends, the police, interviewers. Casey is literally a convicted liar. She has proven to not be a credible witness. So why would people believe she's telling the truth now? When all is said and done, here is what I personally think most likely happened that fateful day on June 16th, the last day that sweet, innocent Kaylee was seen alive. I don't believe that Casey was shaken awake by her father at 9 a.m. looking for Kaylee. I do not really believe that Kaylee had ever been in the pool, nor do I believe Casey's father, George, came to Casey with Kaylee laying in his arms, wet and lifeless, and blamed Casey for it all. Remember those computer searches for foolproof suffocation and chloroform? If her story had been true, if George brought Kaylee in lifeless, there would be no reason for George to then search on how to suffocate because she was already gone. And there would also be no reason for Casey to search how to suffocate again because Kaylee would already have been gone. And as distraught as I've seen George in all of his interviews and trial and his attempted unaliving, even the strange stuff that he said uh, at the memorial service, I don't personally believe that George harmed and ended Kaylee and would have been 
been able to go to work every single day and act completely normal to everyone else. His reactions have been so very strong from the very beginning. It's really hard to imagine that happening. So again, what's the most plausible, obvious, likely truth here? We know from looking at the timestamps and cell phone pings and George and Cindy's work timestamps that Casey's story has a lot of holes in it. George testified that he saw Casey and Kaylee get in her car and leave for what he thought was work around 12.50 p.m. But Casey's cell phone continued to ping the tower that was closest to their home, showing that Casey never actually left the vicinity. George left for work sometime between 2 and 2.49 p.m. and was checked in at work at 3 p.m. Knowing George was off to work, Casey likely returned back to the house because she hadn't really left and got on the computer doing a Google search and MySpace and Facebook, which her friends testified she lived on those sites and no one else in her house had a MySpace account. And during this time, she searches foolproof suffocation and looks at a site that discusses the use of a plastic bag, which of course, Kaylee was found with a plastic bag over her head. At 2.51 p.m., a time where Casey's father had to be on his way to work and not at home, there's a search on the computer for foolproof suffocation followed immediately by Casey going on MySpace again. Casey texted and had a few phone calls with her boyfriend and friends who said that the call was unusual in tone. There was no computer activity from 3 to 4 p.m. and one call to her boyfriend around 3.34 p.m. who did not answer. It is during this window of time that I think Kaylee likely lost her life. Whether it was an accident or planned as the computer search would suggest, we're never gonna know. Then I believe Casey leaves the house around 4 4, 10 p.m., presumably with Kaylee in the trunk. And Casey goes to her boyfriend's house. They go to Blockbuster Video, watch a couple of movies that night, and Casey has no plans of returning to her parents' home to live there again. She goes clubbing, does the hot body contest, lies to absolutely everyone about Zanny the Nanny, a lie that she created, not her father, and gets a tattoo, beautiful life, with this new freedom that she has. And of course, there's the the diary entry, if the date is actually correct. And the worst part of all this is that the actual person who was supposed to have a beautiful life, a life full of love and care and laughter and protection was Kaylee. Sweet, innocent, full of life, wonderful little Kaylee. None of us knew her, but that's, that's what children are, right? They're sweet, they're innocent, and they're wonderful. And she deserved far better than she ever got in this world and that is truly heartbreaking. And while I know that nothing can ever bring her physically back, I do hope that her family finds some sort of healing and peace and that her memory is always a blessing. And that's what I got. Thanks everyone for being here. Give a stranger a compliment just for fun and I will see you in the next one. Swoop!